thing. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us, Lord. You love us. You love us so much. Thank you for the love that there is in the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, Father, for the love that you have put in our hearts for you, for one another. Help us, Lord, one more time, Lord, to learn from your word, Lord. Father, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the natural life, when a baby is born, the baby cannot do much. Can't talk, can't walk, can't do much, and the baby drinks milk only. Somehow that is cute. There's something cute and beautiful about that. However, if after 10 years, 20 years, the baby is still looking like a baby, it's only drinking milk, cannot do much, it is not cute anymore, okay? If after 20 years, still have to change the diaper, still have to give a, the person a bottle, that becomes a concern, okay? So you say, well, what does that have to do with us as Christians? Well, the spiritual life resembles the natural life in many ways. There is a birth in the spiritual life. We are born again. We are born spiritually. And then there is a growth in the spiritual life. And when we are first born spiritually, we are fed spiritual milk. Okay, we're fed the basics of the Christian faith. We are told, uh, we're not given, there is such a thing as spiritual milk and such a thing as spiritual solid food. Okay? As we grow spiritually, we can handle more solid or more mature spiritual food. And we can do more mature things. And we can do things that are expected of mature people to do. Okay, if a, if, a, if, a, if a child is, you know, okay, why are you upset? Well, they didn't give me my cookie today. They didn't give me, okay. The child is five years old, you will understand that. But if you ran into a 25-year-old, you're like, why are you sad? They didn't give me my cookie today. You will say, okay, you have a problem, okay? At this age, you shouldn't be worry that they didn't give you your cookie, you know? Um, so, but, so what that means is, spiritually speaking, there are certain things that you expect of a spiritual infant, there are certain things you expect of a spiritually more mature person. In the same way, there are some responsibilities, um, there are some responsibilities that you, you know, you expect. You don't ask a child, you ask a child, well, uh, where's your food going to come from today? Well, my mom and dad, they're going to provide me lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Um, you know, and so, but if you run into, well, maybe 25-year-olds today also expect uh, their mom to give them breakfast, lunch, and dinner also. I don't know. But at some point, you got to be independent. You know what I mean? There is some responsibility. You're expected to begin to contribute to society. You're expected to grow, and you are now in the position where you should be able to take care of other people. The same is true spiritually as we grow. So, there, Paul, the apostle, planted several churches, and so what I want to talk about today is maturing in Christ, growing in Christ. What does it mean to be a spiritual baby, what does it mean to be a spiritually grown up? What takes us from point A to point B? Because there was a church, Paul planted several churches, and one of those churches was the church in Corinth, okay? The church in Corinth was one of the places where Paul spent a lot of time. Usually he went to a place and they kicked him out after a couple of weeks, persecution came and he had to leave and flee, but miraculously, like in Thessalonica, he was only there for about a couple of weeks. Most people agree, at most two months. But he had to leave because Pastor Frank actually is going to be going there to Thessalonica. Um, soon he's leading a trip out there to Greece and to Turkey. He's going to be visiting, leading a group of people to visit the cities, the towns that the Apostle Paul um, 
planted churches at. Uh, I don't know if you're going to get to be in Corinth or not, but at least, oh, you are going to be in Corinth. Wow, that's so amazing. Don't you feel you would want to switch with Pastor Frank? He stays here and you take his spot to go on the, on the trip. So in that, in Corinth, however, Paul stayed a long time. So in Ephesus, he was there for three years. In Corinth, he was there for a year and a half. Okay? So he really got to invest there. And God told him it was one of those places where Jesus actually spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, you're going to be here I have a lot of people in this city, okay? So Paul was there by the will of God. The church was brought up there by the will of God. The church grew up in the will of the Lord. However, for whatever reason, somehow, this church in Corinth that Paul had invested so much time in, they were like grown babies, Meaning that after so much time, they had not mature yet spiritually. And this is what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, He's verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. Okay? Paul is saying to them, by this time here, I should have been able to give you solid food. By this time here, you ought to have already been mature. If you're taking notes, that's repeated in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. By now, you ought to have been teachers. By now, you should be teaching others. And here's one thing that I've come to believe. It shouldn't take a whole lot of time for people to become what, I consider, what you consider spiritually mature. Why is that? Because Paul says here, by now, you should have been more spiritual. By now, you should have grown up, um, spiritually speaking. By now you ought to have already, I should have been able to give you spiritually solid food, meaning deeper teachings and more advanced. But he said, but I can't, I still have to give you milk. We still have to go through the basic. Now when Paul is writing this, it's about five years after he planted the church. Which means it should take about five years, five and a half years, for someone to develop an acceptable level of spiritual maturity. Shouldn't take forever, okay? It cannot be that after 20 years of being a born-again Christian and listening to all the sermons, singing all the songs, going to retreat and seminar and so forth, we're still spiritual infants. But this was the case for the church in Corinth, the church where the Apostle Paul was there, where he received a vision, you have to be there, work there, I have people there. So what happened in the church in Corinth, okay? There are three ways, three levels of living. We talked about that a bit last week uh, with the passage we read from Romans. Number one, we can live according to the flesh, okay? The flesh means our sinful nature, all of our sinful desire. What I mean is I do whatever pleases me. I want to go out and eat five hamburgers today, I'm going to go and do it. That's what makes me happy. Okay? I want to, someone upset me, and I want to fire off to, to them the nastiest email I could possibly fire off to them. I go ahead and I do that. Okay? Um, I just got a bonus, and I'm going to go and, and waste it on, on something that really has no value. I go ahead and I do it. It's really just living according to what I want, what I feel, what makes me feel good, and so forth. That's living according to the flesh. The result of that is a lot of sin. I feel like I want to go and sleep around with my girlfriend, my boyfriend. I go ahead and I do it. Doesn't matter. It's I live according to what my senses want, what I desire, what I want to do. It's all about pleasing myself. 
The life according to the, that's the first thought. That's the life according to the flesh. There's a consequence to that. The Bible says if you live according to the flesh, what would happen? Romans, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, the Bible says you'll die. Now, that is in the New Testament, okay? Um, it's not, um, you know, it's not that it's me saying that, it's not a pastor saying that, the Word of God said that. So, if you didn't know, so where else in the Bible do you see God warn people, if you do this, you will die? Adam and Eve. God told them, you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Okay? They didn't, the devil came and told them what? No, you're not. You don't take God so seriously. No death is going to come to you if you eat of that fruit. Now, in the New Testament, Paul says to Christians, if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. Now, theologians differ on what that death is. There are some who believe a Christian cannot lose their salvation, so they will say that's not referring to, to death and going to hell. And there are some others say, yeah, what else can it mean? It means you die spiritually. Okay? Now, I don't know in what camp you are there. I have strong view on that, but here's what I will say that will apply to wherever camp you're in, including those watching online. Um, here's what I want to say about that. Death is never good. No matter what type. If you go to the doctor, the doctor say, yeah, this thing will bring you death. And you say to the doctor, that doesn't mean I'm going to completely die, right? J just my leg is going to die, right? Um, you won't say, yeah, no, that's not a big deal, right? Yeah, just my leg is going to die, right? You know, so, okay, well, just your arm, just my finger is going to die, right? No, it, it, no matter what kind of death, that's just bad news. It, it, no matter what kind of death you're talking about, you don't want any of that in you, okay? It's, stay away from it. The, the, don't, you don't want that. You don't want that death. Whatever that death means, you do not want to experience that. So when people come to me and say, well, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to lose my salvation. That doesn't mean I'm going to go to hell. I'm like, so are you just trying to escape hell? Is that really all that you're after? You barely just want to make it to heaven? I'm like, no, I, I don't want someone coming and asking me, how much evil can I do and still make it to heaven and still escape hell? I want someone to come and ask, how, how, much spirit, how spiritual can I become while still being on this side of eternity? How much of God can I have while still being here on earth? How far can I go with Jesus Christ? I don't want someone coming and asking me, how much sin can I do and still make it to heaven? You understand what I mean? It's, it's, not, it's not what's the minimum I can do and still make it to heaven. I want someone to come and say, How, what's the maximum maturity? Can I become mature like Paul? Can I become mature like, can I, how, how Christ-like can I become while still living here? And so Paul says, so the first level of living is living by the flesh. Paul says, you live according to the flesh, you will die. They'll be there, they'll come to you, to your family, to, it, it, it will happen. The devil can come and some other preachers can come and say, no, nothing will happen to you, the grace of God and so forth. Paul said, you live if your lifestyle, I'm not talking about falling in sin, I'm talking about living in the flesh. If our lifestyle is to live according to the flesh, Paul says, there will be death. You can be sure of that. The next level of living is living according to the law. So you start to live according to the rules. Okay, it says, do not do this, do not do that, do not do this, do not do this, do not do that. That's what they had in the Old Testament. They were given the law. Moses gave them 600 and plus commandments that they tried hard to obey, and they tried to add more to it in order to obey it. The result of that is this, what we read in, in, in Romans chapter 7 last week. The law was good. What the law said to do was perfect, was great. The only problem is the law gave people no power to actually obey it. 
okay? So people were left to struggle on their own, by their own strength, and the result of that was failure. And the issue with the law, please listen carefully here. You may not hear this very often. The issue with the law is there is a curse. The law puts a curse on all those who want to live by it and fail to live by it. You read that in Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, okay? So, th th that experiment failed, okay? People try hard, including Paul himself, who was as blameless as anybody in terms of keeping the law. He could not resist the sin of coveting, as he mentions in Romans chapter 7. The law had no power. It was weakened by the flesh. There was not enough. The willpower of men to live according to the law was not enough. Sin was too strong. And just the fact that the law is good was not enough of an incentive for people to live by it and obey it, okay? So now Jesus comes and brings another level of living, which is living by the Spirit of God, okay? That's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit does not give us a law. It gives us life. Let me get back to the... Um, let me get back to my analogy about a baby. See, life comes with certain things. For example, a baby is not given any law. He's not told when you're hungry, you know, uh, by the way, you need to eat and you need to feel hungry. And when you feel hungry, you need to let someone know. The fact that there is life in the child means that the child would sense hunger, that I need to eat. And the child will begin to cry and let somebody know, I am hungry. And that's all part of life. There, this baby is not given a law. He's not told you must eat in order for you to grow and, and, and be healthy. It's the result of life. When people are the spirit of God in them, there are certain things they will automatically be aware of. They will know. They will have spiritual hunger. They will want to read the word of God. They will want to pray. They, they will feel just like that child, that baby, when their, their, their diaper is full, they, they feel uncomfortable. They want you to come and clean them up and, and change that diaper, and they'll cry until you do. The child is not given a law. He's not told you must do this. Hey, when you are dirty, that's not good. You have to cry and let somebody come and chisel. They automatically do it because it's the result of someone having healthy life within them. The same is true when we become born again. A person who is born again uh, with the Spirit of God dwelling in them, they will know when they fall into sin. Sin is like that dirt. Okay, I need to be cleansed. That, 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 this is not good. I feel dirty. I need to have this cleaned out of me. Yes, yes. It's not a law. It's not someone tells them, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do that. Children need to be told, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. As we mature spiritually, as an adult, no one has to tell you, come on, brush your teeth, do all these things. You, you do these things because you're now an adult. You have grown up, okay? So you don't need to be told all the things you used to be told as a child. So now, in the same way, we don't live by the law. There are laws in the New, in the New Testament. There are commands. In fact, there are more of them in the New Testament almost twice as much in the New Testament as there are in the Old Testament. However, we do not live that by saying, okay, here are all the commands. I got to keep this. I got to keep that. I got to help the poor. I got to do this. I have to be nice to my brothers and sisters. I have to not keep grudges. It's not like that. It is that the Holy Spirit comes within us and begin to produce a certain type of life in us. Okay. That is the only way that we can live a holy life. The only way. If you try it any other way, it will not work. It will not work. Just try loving those who hate you and persecute you and speak spitefully, which Jesus does command to do in, in Matthew chapter 5. You cannot do that by your own strength. Okay. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Try to do that in your own strength. You will not be able to. Let's give up trying to do it in our own strength. It is by the Spirit of God, okay? Now, growing spiritually, growing spiritually and maturing in Christ is that progression where we turn away from living according to the flesh. We live away from turning to from living according to the law 
and where we allow the Spirit of God to begin to do His work in us. That is how we grow spiritually. It is a work and an act of the Holy Spirit. So I want to um, mention this here as I'm going to start to conclude this. So what are the marks? Why does Paul say that these, this church here was still unspiritual, was still carnal? That's another way of putting it, or worldly, or carnal, or immature. Well, here's what he says. Number one, you, <coughs> he says you are still worldly, for since there is jealousy, quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Okay? For uh, you are not acting, are you not acting like mere men? One of the sure signs that people are still carnal, unspiritual, is there is strife, jealousy, quarreling. How come he got to sing and I didn't get to sing? Um, how come they let him do that at church and they don't let me do it? Um, how come, um, you know, um, by the way, you know, jealousy, one of the worst things that can enter your heart. Please listen. When you're jealous of someone, you don't have a problem with. You know who you're having a problem with, with God. You're saying to God, how dare you bless that person like that? You shouldn't. How come you give them God? How come you allow them to get that promotion? I have a problem with you, God. That's what jealousy is. It's why it is so corrosive and so bad. God blesses someone, listen, agree with God. Say, praise the Lord. Okay? They got a new car, praise the Lord. If they didn't steal the money, they bought it, praise the Lord. May God bless them with more. They got a Mercedes, may God give them a Rolls Royce. Okay? That's God's thing. Let God do what he wants to do with the people's life. Okay, don't, let's not fall into jealousy. And, and it also means, jealousy is also bad because it means you're not trusting God. You're not trusting God that he can bless you. What God has intended for you, you will have. Let's just stop looking at what other people have, okay? It is, it is corrosive, it is bad. And it is a sign, Paul says here, this is spiritual immaturity, okay? Um, you're still worldly. Jealousy, quarreling, fighting. Why did you do this? Why do you, why do you look at me like that? How come you didn't say hello to me? Fighting over things that have no spiritual weight. Like, it, it, is, it is a sign of immaturity. Because one of the things that quarreling does is this. It's that we don't have the strength to fight the spiritual battle. We spend all our energy fighting one another, and then there's nothing left to fight the devil with. Okay, That's one thing. The other thing um, that was there, there was division, factions. Paul says, for one says, I follow Paul, and others say, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere men? Meaning, are you not just like everybody else? When you have cliques and, and political parties within the church, effectively, this one says, you, oh yeah, I belong to Paul, I belong to Peter. And, and then and Paul says later, um, Paul says later, there are some who were, there were some who were even um, smarter. They said, I don't belong to Paul, I, don't, I belong to Christ. <laughs> they were smarter, but Paul says even some of those people were unspiritual because it, it, was, just, it was just a slogan, okay? We as Christians, the church, Asked to be united. Someone said this, and I think it's such a great thing to remember. The ch Satan is not afraid of a large church. He's afraid of a united church. When people are together, as we were praying this week, the Bible says it is there that the Lord commands a blessing, even eternal life when brothers dwell together in unity. That's Psalm 131. Okay? Uh, behold how good and how pleasant it is where brothers dwell together in unity. It is like oil being poured out on the head of Aaron. If you were not at the morning prayer, I shared about that. That means the anointing of God is poured out upon that place. And number two, he said, it is there that the Lord commends a blessing, even eternal life. 
spiritual life grows in the place where people, in the church where people are united. Now, Paul later says that, uh, he said, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe that um, because there, there are some divisions that can come when it has to do with following the truth, where it has to do with sin and compromise. If there is, you have people who say, okay, no, I'm okay with people living in sin. No, no, we, we cannot have unity like that. Okay? Paul says in that case, division makes sense. But the fighting over, well, I want this, I prefer that, I prefer this, just say, that that's just immaturity. Okay? And then later on, he, talk, he continues to talk to the Corinthians. In chapter 5, Paul says, I'm going to give you about seven marks of, the, of a, of a, of a of spiritual immaturity, okay? Chapter 5, it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of the kind that does not occur even among pagans. Okay? A man has his father's wife. He says that there was so much sexual immorality not even among the pagans were people found to do what was happening now. This is in the church, a church that Paul planted church that Paul planted. One of the things that you will always see when there is um, spiritual decline, you will always see in any society and in any church, you will always see there start to be a permissiveness when it comes to relationships between men and women. Okay? It first began with, well, it's okay. They're going to get married anyway. It's okay for them to be sleeping together. Okay? Then uh, sooner after that, it's, well, you know what? Uh, it's a slippery slope. And then later, it's, well, what do they need to be married anyways? And then it's, well, it's okay if a man and a man get married. I mean, who are you to judge, you know? Love is love, and a uh, woman and a woman, and so forth. It's a slippery slope, okay? And you look around to what has happened to a lot of churches, including most historical churches that have a history like ours, okay? Uh, they all, most of them have gone down that path, okay? And um, there is a quote from Tozer. I was listening to a message by A.W. Tozer. Anyone here knows who A.W. Tozer is? Fine man of God who was preaching in the early, previous half and mid, middle of last century. Uh, I heard a message of his from 1960. From 1960. He was speaking about the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the need for a Pentecost. I wrote the quote somewhere, and you know, but pretty much almost word for word, here's what he said. He said, if we don't have an outpouring of God's Spirit in the churches in North America, if we don't have the Holy Spirit poured out and we all have a Pentecost and we continue just a little longer the way we're going, he says, all the liberals, what he called the liberal Christians, will become Unitarians. And he said all the evangelicals will become liberals, and there won't be much left except a few empty buildings. That was in 1960. And you, I, I, I re, had to rewind that a few times because of how prophetic that was. It, it has happened, what he predicted. What a prophetic word that was. And it's often, and some of that begins with this. You start to see the crack in the moral, what's like morally accepted, and so forth. And when pastors, preachers don't have the courage to say, no, we cannot have that here. You cannot live like that and continue to be here. It, it is fine when someone comes from the world, they come into church, they don't know much. They, no, that's, that's a different thing. But when somebody wants to be a part, a consistent part of the church, at some point, we're going to ask you, well, who are you living with? Okay? You want to serve at our church? Well, who do you live with? Are you married to that person? What's your relationship with them like? And if they're living, we're going to say, no, you have to repent. And if you don't want to repent, at some point, we're going to ask you to leave. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not very popular, but that's what the Bible teaches. Okay? Otherwise, it's a slippery slope. At the end, you find yourself, and it doesn't work. At the end, it's not the devil. At the end, it is God who ends up shutting the doors. 
The other thing that happened, they were taking each other to court. Um, there's a self-centeredness that developed in the church in Corinth. Paul said, but why don't you just choose to lose? Christians were taking other Christians to court. Um, and they were taking each other to court. And Paul says, well, listen, don't, don't you even have someone um, who can mediate between brothers? How come you're a Christian, you're, taking, you're going to an unbeliever to resolve your dispute with another Christian in front of him? But that's not a good testimony. The other thing that was happening there, there was a lot of pride. Paul says to them in chapter 5, verse 2, and you are proud. You, there, there's so much immorality among you, and yet you're proud. He says, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the men who did this? Speaking of the person who was living immorally. He said, you should have had grief instead of being proud. Now, what were they proud about? Okay. They were proud because they had spiritual gift. Now, listen here carefully. That church that had divisions, that had factions, that had jealousy and quarreling, and that had rampant sexual immorality of the kind that was not even found in the world, yes, that church had spiritual gift. They prophesied, they spoke in tongues, there were miracles, and so forth. Paul does not say all that stuff is fake. He said you, it's real. You do have prophets in your midst. You do prophesy. It was real. But see, here's a mistake that they make and the mistake that a, a lot of folks make. Spiritual gifts are given because God is good. God wants to bless people. So he enables people to prophesy. He enables people to pray and God answers the prayers. He enables people to pray for the sick and the sick gets healed. And the Corinthians were looking at that saying, see, see, see like we, this person prophesied and that thing happened. This person had this word of knowledge and it was exactly what this person needed. They spoke into their lives and they had no idea what's going on in the life of this person. And yet they were able to give that person a word that was specific to their circumstance. That's prophecy. It's miraculous. It's amazing. And Paul says, you're right, you do have spiritual gifts, and they are for real. But you see, they mistook that. That means God is pleased with us. That means we're doing well spiritually. And I want to tell you this, please listen carefully. Miracles, spiritual gifts, supernatural things are not an evidence that God is pleased with a Christian or with the church. God does miracles simply out of his goodness. The Bible says he causes his rain to fall on the righteous and on the unrighteous. When God sends rain, all the farmers receive that rain. The godly farmers, the ungodly farmers. Okay? When God causes the sun to shine, it's not just godly people who walk out and see the sunshine. Everybody benefits from it. Okay? That's just the goodness of God to the people that he created, to the church. You read in the Old Testament, you read about Samson, a man who had supernatural powers given him by God, yet he was living an ungodly life. When we grow spiritually, what is what I'm trying to say? Listen careful. As we grow spiritually, we realize God values character more than he values spiritual achievements. Okay. God values character more than he values spiritual gift. But let's be honest with ourselves. The truth is, even in the body of Christ, that's not the way things roll. Okay. When someone is invited to speak at a Christian conference, when they're selecting who to preach, you know what they'd say? Let's get the person who is the best speaker, the most eloquent. He can hold the crowd's attention. He's so articulate. And he brings out such clever points and so forth. People don't ask, well, what is his life like? What does his wife think of him? What are his children like? Have you ever heard seen that? Someone gets introduced. They said, he has written 40 books. He is pastor, teacher, author, doctor, and so forth. These are all his accolades. 
and he pastors a church of uh, 3,000 people, and so forth. There is hardly ever anything mentioned about character. When you read, we're going to get to it in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when it gives the requirements for an elder, for a church leader. It's all about character. There is only one item there, that, and it's almost like buried in all the others. It's able to teach. Other than that, it's all he must be temperate, kind, respectful. He must have his, keep his family in order, and so forth and so forth. It's all about character. To God, character matters more than achievement. Jesus said, people will come to me on the last day and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we preached in your name. We did miracles in your name. We prophesied in your name. And Jesus will say, say I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you evil doers. Okay? Which means you live as though there was no law. You live the lawless life. Jesus did not say, no, your miracles were fake. Depart from me, your miracles were fake. He does not say that. He said, it is true you did miracles, and I did miracles true, yes. Out of my goodness for the people, I did that. Not as an endorsement of your spirituality. We ought to believe, we have to know that and believe that. Character matters to God more than achievements and gifts and so forth. So now, I'm going to close here. What was the solution for this church? Paul wrote to them two letters. There are not that many churches, you know. Uh, the, only, the only church that got two letters from Paul. Oh, no, sorry. There's Thessalonians as well. Not many churches received two letters. There's two letters to Corinthians, two letters to Thessalonians, and two letters to Timothy. Okay. What was the solution for them? Number one, I want to say this as we close. First, it is to remember our calling, okay? So when Paul opens this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says this, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. Paul was telling them right off from the beginning, this is what you are called to. You are called to be holy. As Christians, that's our calling. God calls us to be holy. Now, some people will hear that and say, man, that sounds hard. You mean I have to be holy? I can sin. I can, enjoy, I can enjoy this. But my life will be boring and my life will be terrible and unhappy. Listen, let me tell you this. We are happiest when we are holiest. We are happiest when don't let the world fool you. Don't let anybody fool you. Talk to those who go and do whatever it is that they want, whatever. They drink whatever they want to drink. They sleep with whoever they want to sleep with. They do whatever they want. They are not happy. They pretend to be. Talk to them. Let them open their hearts and talk to you. As I have had to sit down with many, they will tell you there's nothing out there. It leaves you hurt, it leaves you broken, it leaves you in shame, it leaves you empty. Amen. Pleasure in it, yeah, but no joy. It brings death in the end. We, God created us such that we are happiest when we are holiest. There is no amount of money, there's no vacation, there's no, nothing physical, nothing of this world you can receive that will bring as much joy and satisfaction, and I'll use that word happiness, as when you are holy. So when God tells us to live a holy life, he's not trying to rain on our parade or make our life work. He's actually trying to bless us and show us the way to happiness. The thing is just that most people have never known that other way. All they have known is the way of the world. 
and they've been convinced that that's the only way to live, that that's the only way to live. They've never tried the alternative. And the alternative is follow Jesus. The Bible says there is joy in your presence, pleasures at your right hand, fullness of joy in the presence of God. And I want to say to anybody, listen, you're watching this out there, I want to tell you, if you have never had the experience of being alone with God, with your Bible, when you really gave God a genuine opportunity to speak to you, you will experience joy and fulfillment like you never have before. Okay? You are going to realize it doesn't take a $5,000 vacation to Aruba to be happy. Okay? You can be, have the happiness and the joy of God in your home. All you need is get in the presence of God. Get in the presence of God. I know it sounds unbelievable to someone who's never experienced it before. But listen, God created us. And he created us so that we function best, we live best, we think best, we perform best when we are in a relationship with him close relationship with him. Sin is the ruiner. Sin is, sin is what comes to ruin everything. It's what destroys our joy, destroys our peace, destroys our hope, destroys our homes, our marriages, our children. Sin is the spoiler. Not God and not holiness. Okay? I ask you to give God a chance. Come back to the calling. The calling that we have. It's a calling to live holy. And you will realize that that calling leads us to joy and to happiness. Secondly, there has to be repentance. Now that's not a word that's very popular. Repentance simply means that I turn, okay? I go from being a person who does what I want to being a person who says I'm going to do what God wants. It's really all it means. I turn from one way of living my life to another way of living my life. And I want to tell you what the Bible promises. It's in Hebrews chapter 1. I won't read it, but you can go read it at home. You have, loved, you have hated wickedness and loved righteousness. Therefore, God, your God, the Lord your God has blessed you with an anointing of joy or an anointing of gladness, depending on your translation. Why? Because you hated wickedness and you loved righteousness. When there is a turn... God bless us with joy. In our culture, we think that if I get what I want, then I'll be happy. If I get what I want, then I'll be happy. You know why there's so much depression, in my view? It's actually because we keep getting what we want. And then we've, once we get what we want, we realize it does not satisfy us. Then where do you go after that? You, you've gotten what you wanted, and it did not satisfy. Now what do you do? You're not confused. Wait, I thought if I get this, I'll be happy. Well, you got it now, but now you're not happy. Okay? It's because we keep getting what we want. If we turn from that kind of life to a life of God, I want to do what you want. And you do what God wants for you, for your family. You know what God is going to do? Fill your heart with joy. Amen. Fill your heart with joy. And in fact, in Hebrew, you read that, you study that, it is amazing. He said, it's not just going to give you joy. It's like an anointing of joy comes upon you. It's almost like contagious joy, okay? There has to be repentance. I'm not going to go through it, but if you're taking note, you can write this down. First, 2 Corinthians 7, 11. That's a description of what repentance looks like. It's easy to remember. 7, 11. 2 Corinthians 7, 11. That's, how, that's what repentance looks like. Lastly, a return to what matters. Second Corinthians 11, you've heard me, I probably quoted this verse more than I've quoted any other verse over the past year and a half because this is something the Lord had been teaching me. For about seven years, God was reminding me over and over and over and over and over, the Christian life is about Jesus Christ. Everything else is a distraction. Okay, Here, here's what it says. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, I am jealous for you. That is Paul. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. What was he jealous? Say, I promise you to one husband, to Christ, 
so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul said, I am afraid that, you won't, that you'll stop coming to church. No. Say, I'm afraid you'll stop paying your tithes and offerings. No. It's interesting, one of the unique things about the Corinthian church also, Paul refused to take any financial help from them. Um, there's a debate whether that was a right decision or not. But he did not. He repeats that in the second Corinthians. This takes like two chapters to say that. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, he said, I'm afraid, though. I'm concerned about you. He writes like a father to his children. I am afraid that you will be led astray from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. The Christian life has to be brought back to what matters. What matters is a relationship with Jesus. It's not about miracles. It's not about prophecies. It's not even about helping the poor. All of those things are good. All of those things are good. It's not about studying the Bible. All of that is fine. The Christian life is about a pure and sincere devotion to a person, to Jesus Christ. It's about a relationship with the person. When you bring that back at the center, what I will do is to put you and me in the mindset that says this, my life is about loving Jesus Christ. Is this and that and that consistent with loving Jesus or no? If it is not, then I put it away. And when we approach life with that mindset, you know what happens? We not only love God, we love our brothers and sisters. Because if you know that these are Jesus' brothers and sisters as well, these are the people that Jesus loved, how will you treat them? You'll treat them with love. The Christian life is about a pure, sincere devotion to Jesus. Now, Satan is smart. He will do anything to distract you, to make it about anything else. And he does not care what a thing is. He can make the Christian life become about which party you're going to vote for. You know, we have an election coming up. We're going we're to we're take a day to pray about that. And it's all about, okay, this candidate has to win or that candidate has to win, and Christians are spending more time being pro-Democrat or being pro-Republican than they're spending being devoted to Jesus Christ. And the devil does not care which side you take. As long as you replace Jesus Christ with that, he's happy. As long as you replace Jesus Christ with that, he's happy. And it can be anything. I've mentioned that before. For some people during the pandemic, it became being pro-mask or anti-mask or pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. Whatever your views are, as long as you took that and you replaced Jesus Christ with that, the devil didn't care. He was happy. I know a church that shut down over that issue. They split, and neither group was able to survive on its own. Who do you think was happy about that in the end? Do you think he cared which side was right? Doesn't matter. It is about a pure and sincere devotion to Jesus Christ. It's when that is lost that all of these other things follow. It's when people start to fight, when there start to be jealousy, when there start to be quarrels. When it's when it is no longer about Jesus Christ. Even our building can become a distraction from Jesus Christ. There were no build, you know Jesus never built a building. There were no church building until about 300 years after, later on. They met in homes, they met at the temple. Sometime Paul did have a lecture hall in, in Ephesus that he preached at. But do we thank God we have a building and we thank God so much for all the miracles he's doing for our building. If anybody does not believe in God answering prayer, please send them to our building. 
I'll give them a tour. By the time they're done with the tour, they will believe there's a God in heaven. Okay? If they're an honest person, they, they will believe there's a God in heaven. Okay? It, but we thank God for that. But our hope is that the building be used simply as a tool to get people to love Jesus. I'll tell you, every day that I come here and I get to go upstairs, I walk around in that sanctuary. You know what I pray? I say, God, fill this place with people who love Jesus and who want to learn to love him. God is my witness that that is the prayer I have prayed over and over and over and over and over and over. I walk over that sanctuary and I pray, Lord, fill this place with people who will love Jesus Christ and those who will want to learn to how to love him. That's what a church is about. If the building is used for that, God will be pleased. If it's just for having a nice building, listen, the Mormons and others also have nice buildings. You know, it's, that's not what it's about. It's about people loving Jesus Christ, being drawn to him, becoming like him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Let's stand. Father, you desire joy in our hearts. And what greater way, what, what better way could there be, Lord, for us to have joy than by us refocusing on Jesus? What better way for us to grow spiritually than to make up our minds? We will pursue Jesus Christ and likeness to him. Lord, I pray, make us a people, Lord, who grow, who mature in you, Lord. Help us not to be distracted, but to focus on what matters as individuals and as a church. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Draw us all closer to you this week, Lord. That everyone here, Lord, will spend time drawing closer to you, time in the scripture, time in prayer. Bring us here, Lord, on Wednesday night to pray, to draw closer to you. Father, we pray for all those who have become distracted, Lord. Bring them back to focus. We pray, Father, Lord, for our families. May every family that's represented here, Lord, be saved and focused on Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the ways that you are drawing us, for the ways that you are bringing us closer to you, for the ways that you are reawakening our hearts. Thank you for the week of prayer we had here, Lord, and the way you blessed us with your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this season in our church. Thank you, Lord. For this season, Father, of renewal of revitalization of revival thank you father help us to keep our eyes focused on you lord in jesus name amen